Hello, everybody, and thanks for being here. I'm going to be talking today about Kotlin Native for multi-platform development, and uh, I think it might overlap uh, slightly with some of the things that my colleague Guillermo has been saying, but I hope anyway that uh, you learn something new today and it can bring you some value. Just very shortly about me, I'm a freelance developer from <coughs> Spain. You can guess that based on my accent. I'm a Google developer expert for Kotlin and Android. I handle the Kotlin weekly publication, so if you want some stickers later, please. I think I still have six. Uh, <coughs> this is my Twitter account. Uh, I sometimes talk about code and things that interest me uh, regarding software engineering. And I'm mainly involved with Android and uh, Kotlin development, uh, backend mostly with Kotlin, and iOS uh, mostly with Swift. I wish I could put more Kotlin, and that's something I'm actively working with. Now, motivation about working with uh, multi-platform development, and particularly Kotlin Native. Well, some people think that uh, when we are moving into a multi-platform framework, we are going to decrease the cost. Whereas this is right, I um, try to argue that uh, this is more about the quality than the cost, and I think we should have this mentality uh, rather than making things cheaper. Um, this also provides some interesting approaches uh, when we are having the same code base, and this is uh, distributed through a team in a company, we can start doing things such as sharing code within the company. We can have our own libraries that many teams might be working. Something interesting is that we can start working with feature teams. That is, people will not be working anymore in Android or in iOS. They will be working with the login feature or the payment feature, which um, I think it um, can raise new challenges and um, things like you specialize in a topic and the platform is not that um, particular, uh, particularly important anymore. And of course, having one tech stack instead of uh, three, four, or five. So how this multi-platform development has worked out? We had before things uh, that were platform proprietary, such as Java back in the past, an Xcode. If you've been here for some time, you've seen probably things like PhoneGap, those hybrid HTML and JavaScript frameworks, lately these uh, cross-platform uh, native frameworks such as Summary or React. I actually was uh, talking uh, recently with some colleagues, and one of the ideas for, I thought always that people would use those frameworks to save on cost, but interestingly for mobile development, some people jump into using these JavaScript frameworks because it's very hard to find uh, native iOS developers or native uh, Android developers, and JavaScript is something that has been there for a while, seems easier to recruit, so that might be something that could be happening. And now particularly, why Kotlin? Well, Kotlin is a modern language. Java first version was released in 1995, which is in the dinosaur time uh, in our world. There seem to be another issues. Um, <coughs> so if, uh, uh, well, you know, Oracle is uh, on Java. Uh, Oracle is this company that has more lawyers than developers. This is actually true. <laughs> they deal more with copyright than with actually developing code. And, uh, well, it seems that some companies were a little bit uh, stuck into Java, and they could not uh, jump into the new versions on Java, and, um, well, why not a different thing? Why, why not something like Kotlin? You're here at a conference called Kotliner, so you already know a lot of things about uh, Kotlin. Uh, it can interoperate with different languages, so it can talk with, uh, with Java seamlessly. It has a big community support. Many libraries have been developed by the community are uh, widely used in, in many apps. It has a top-notch tooling. JetBrains is uh, it's known for having developed Kotlin, but they develop a um, uh, uh, software to program with almost any language you can use. You can use PHP Storm, PyCharm, uh, you have IntelliJ, and th those are really top quality uh, platforms. And one good thing is that sharing is optional. There is no life for that commitment. When you start using Kotlin Native, it doesn't mean that you have to jump into this technology and forget about anything else. You can make a small introduction, you can step by step jump in into Kotlin Native, and this is something that fits you or not. It's not like you just have to forget about what uh, was there before. Now, this is the current situation. Um, last year in the Kotlin Conf, in the last quarter, the version 0.9.3 was released. That was, uh, this is still a beta version. I think there was some um, 
uh, some people was expecting a fully stable release by that time, but it didn't happen. Um, I don't think it's that, uh, um, it wouldn't be that weird if they release it this year, but you never know what's going to happen in the, in the future. This version 9.3 includes the ID tooling and the, and the coroutines, and is what we have um, right now. Now, before Kotlin uh, native, we had something called Kotlin Anywhere. That was the uh, primal idea. The idea is that we would be developing a server, and we could be deploying on Android and the browser, because they serve many elements. Now, JetBrain puts it a little bit farther uh, into what we call now Kotlin native. This would work conceptually. We would have a common module that contains the, um, the actual definition of the, the functionality we're going to use, and a GBM and a native module. And uh, of course, uh, GS. GS transpile, it doesn't compile directly. That's why um, it's here differently. And for mobile developers, uh, you would generally have an iOS and an Android application. In the case of the iOS app, you would have your, um, your native module that is compiling into an iOS framework that just can be inserted into your Xcode project and can be used by your iOS developer. Whereas Android would just compile and uh, would be used by your Android app. So what should we do with uh, Kotlin native? What should we serve? Well, the idea is to serve architecture and not UI. Why? Because Google doesn't care about the UI of iOS, and uh, Apple doesn't care about the UI of Google. They are fundamentally different. They have different patterns. They have uh, uh, different interaction methods. You can easily uh, compile, uh, program it once and deploy it to several platforms. The serve UI is a mess. But we got the, under this, under the, the, the UI of the, an application, everything is the same. What do we do? We talk with a backend. We talk with a web service. We get some JSON information. We serialize this, uh, this data. We deal with this data and store it in a database. That's something that iOS and Android are essentially doing uh, and operating the same way. Now, Kotlin Native, it uses uh, LLVM 5.0. Uh, this is a collection of modular and reusable compiler technologies. Um, it provides uh, runtime warranties, things such as exceptions and memory management. In ca it can interoperate with C and Objective-C and, and obviously Swift, not with C++, unsurprisingly. And it contains platform libraries for things like uh, POSIX, uh, Apple Frameworks, Win32, DOM, etc. It's surprisingly intuitive. Uh, we would uh, have our Kitty Kotlin source file where we are developing in Kotlin. This will go through the Kotlin compiler towards an intermediate representation that goes to the LLVM compiler and compiles into the platform binary. The compiler itself serves the same front end with uh, Kotlin GVM and Kotlin GS. It's finally written partially in Java and in Kotlin, and produces the bit code via the API from the LLVM compiler. Now, a few things about the memory management. Um, if you develop with Swift, uh, with Objective-C, you're familiar with uh, ARC. It uses uh, ARC with a cycle collector. When we are working, however, with pure Kotlin, we don't need to worry about uh, memory management. That is uh, done by, by Kotlin. There are weak references supported, and the memory sharing module is different of what you've been using until now. So different threads can have a, a disjoint object graphs. Uh, the object subgraphs can be transferred between threads, and immutable objects or super immutable objects can be shared. Now, it, how it, interp it interoperates? Um, it can talk with C, with Objective-C, and with Swift. So Kotlin can call these classes and the other way around. And uh, the memory management is aware of what happens with Objective-C under the hood. There is some mapping between classes and between uh, structures, so numbers are kept, strings are converted to the destination platform. Kotlin declarations um, uh, grabbing C entities, such as uh, functions, structs, or unions, are auto-generated. And there is always an equivalent between the object-oriented concepts, such as uh, classes um, um, are, um, in um, in Kotlin can be, will be classes, uh, things like uh, blocks in uh, Swift will be lambdas in Kotlin, etc. And as I mentioned, for Objective-C, everything will be compiled into an iOS framework that can be just imported into our iOS app and be used directly. Something interesting as well, uh, well, we have this Kotlin library that, uh, similar to how a Java library works, it holds a collection of code for reusability and sharing. 
it has in some format KLIF, uh, which holds all the metadata of the, um, uh, the code that is inside and the bitcode itself. And there is some tooling to create and store libraries in uh, repositories. So no technology means anything without libraries. And there are a few libraries that have been already developed. Those libraries are developed and maintained by JetBrains. Ktor is a client server, uh, networking, um, atomic helper. Um, we have Kotlin X IO for uh, IO operations and uh, the famous coroutines. I don't want to go in detail too much with them. I particularly like Ktor uh, a lot. Um, if you're developing uh, anything with the backend, I think it's, it's pretty simple how it works and it does the, the job very good. So uh, this is how it would look. We would have to define the port where we want to uh, start our application. We can have this routine specifying the HTTP method that we want to call. And through the method call, we could send uh, some JSON back or um, deal with uh, when, when this endpoint is being called. We can um, define headers very easily in uh, any of our calls. So here we would have the uh, next developer header or uh, any more standard ones calling the object uh, HTTP headers. We just call them with these install default headers, and they're automatically added. This would be a very simple endpoint. We would uh, call through a get method the uh, endpoint programmer and see how easy actually is to get uh, directly the JSON. We would have just an object called author that has a name and an um, address or a surname or whatever we want. And with uh, calling to the method respond and passing this object, we'll automatically serialize in a JSON object, which is, is easy to deploy. This could be an example with a bit more of routines. So we see that we can have a post or delete uh, methods uh, also very easily. Um, if we pass uh, with this markdown the uh, ID, for example, in the method delete, we would be able to access it uh, later on the function and, and operate with it if we want to remove something on also or operate as we want. There are a few other community projects. SQL Delight, I think Guillermo has been talking a bit about it. It's a model facilitation library for uh, SQLite. CNARDDB, uh, sort of an SQL access library with uh, Android-like uh, structures and interface. The Stately, a state and threading facilitation library for uh, Kotlin native and multi-platform. And the multi-platform settings that are it's sort of like shared preferences in Android and NS user defaults in, in Swift, I think. And um, some of these uh, libraries have you might know them from, um, um, well, they have offices in Canada and in New York. And another one's from TouchLab. TouchLab is an agency in New York that uh, has, is investing quite a lot in Kotlin Native right now. In order to make it uh, Kotlin Native work through our common and uh, native models, we would play with the expect and actual keywords. Expects defines our um, how the, the how this class is expected to be implemented on the common model. This would be an example. Uh, see the keyword expect before any class, and uh, here it would be the actual model, the one that goes uh, the actual uh, keyword, the ones that goes into the uh, native or uh, GBN model. Um, all actual declarations that match any part in an expected declaration, need to have the actual keyword in front of them. And expected declarations never contain any implementation code. So they would be just like um, defining the what you are expecting from them. Um, it's easier to see with an uh, example of something very easy, such as uh, how do we um, log in different platforms. That's something that we always need to do. We use different logs in uh, Android, Swift, um, in uh, JavaScript. So we could have something like this. Uh, we would expect a function called write log message that uh, receives a message and uh, the required low level that uh, is defined as an enum at the top. And the implementation would look like this. This would be the implementation for the GBM machine, where we get uh, whatever low level and uh, print the, the message later. And in uh, JavaScript, it would work slightly different. We would. Uh, could have, uh, depending on the sort of log level we have, we might want to use the console object to print it one way or the other one. Now, some considerations in a state when we're talking about Kotlin native. An object only belongs to one thread. It cannot belong to several of them. 
Now, if we want to serve them, we need to have a frozen object. A frozen object can be served by threads. This is a new concept from JetBrains. Frozen essentially means super immutable. The object is immutable and all the references. It's something different that you probably haven't dealt with in any previous uh, language or technology you've been working with. So to came with the thought of, uh, well, what, how do I know what is frozen? Well, essentially, everything that you have written until now is not frozen. So it's something that you would start doing now if you're dealing with Kotlin native. Some other things, there are no threading primitives uh, such as uh, synchronize or volatile. Instead of using them, you should use something like uh, Atomic FU. Um, there is runtime safety, so Kotlin native can um, verify safe uh, mutability. And um, I would like to give a few considerations. Uh, people think is, well, Kotlin native ready to be used in production or not, uh, what should I do? Well, this is something that got sorted out a month ago. Check this login view model. You have something like a username, a password, uh, etc. The password has some generics, right? A subject with a string. Well, um, when you were using before this in Swift, um, the generic could not be accessed from Swift. And that's something that could prevent you very strongly from adopting uh, Kotlin native. It has been merged um, 24 days ago, so now it's, uh, it will be supported from now on in the, in the next versions, or you can always download a Kotlin uh, a native, build it by yourself with the latest state. Another thing is that uh, coroutines are not yet multi-threaded. There is a proposal uh, to be merged at some point, but it's not uh, quite there yet, and that's something that might be new uh, or at least uncommon for many people that has been developing using the old paradigm. So also, what about iOS devs? I think, uh, how many people here are Android developers? Can you raise your hand? OK, so you already use Kotlin. You're probably excited about it. Uh, you've been developing with Kotlin for a while. I found that when you go to an iOS conference and you start talking about these things, are, people are not that enthusiastic. Because it's like, Kotlin, well, I've already developed with Swift. Why not? doing things with Swift, and um, I think it's uh, when you're working in a team that is multidisciplinary, you'll face this problem of um, um, iOS developers not being that um, fascinated about the perspective or changing their language and jumping into another one. And this can be a blocker when you're talking with a real organization. Now, how to get this started? If you want to, uh, you can download Kotlin Native and uh, build it by yourself. Uh, you just need to clone this repository. You need to update all the dependencies. So if you plan to work on the plane, do it before you jump into the plane. Otherwise, you will not be able to work. You need to execute the bundle <coughs> program. Also, don't do it when you are uh, before jumping into the plane. And it's, it's just easy. You just can uh, call a function like this, Kotlin C or Kotlin uh, uh, C minus native, and it uh, works. Um, I would like to just do it very fast here, so you can see an example of uh, that this is real and actually works. So we could have something like this file, uh, this very easy file called uh, hello world that just have a print line and uh, you know no special packages or anything. Let's see if I can get here no special import. So pretty simple. Now um, we could call something like this Kotlin C um, native file. I was discussing with Eugene before that um, uh, what I did, uh, it was uh, downloading uh, Kotlin uh, native by myself and uh, trying to compile. And as you see, it takes a, a significant amount of time when you do it by yourself. It compiles into this file. Uh, you just now can uh, execute the, the file called hello text, and it will print um, this. Um, let's see if I can come back what you have inside. So um, you don't need to build it by yourself. You just can probably download the binaries directly from the uh, JetBrains, and it will probably be a little bit faster. But it works. Essentially, this file uh, could be compiled uh, against any POSIX architecture, and it could uh, be uh, reduced wherever. Um, so now let me go to the next. Uh, so things about the future. I think for all of us, the question is, should we use Kotlin native? Should we introduce it in our projects? 
Well, I think it's very hard to make predictions. If not, we will all be betting on the stock market and being rich within uh, one or two years. I read this thing in an article called How to be a developer after 30 from a guy called Adrian Kowaczewski. And uh, I think this is very representative. You don't know what's going to happen in 10 years, uh, but there will be always people in Stack Overflow uh, asking about regular expressions, and there will be another JavaScript framework. I think in 10 years, probably, there will be another multi-platform framework. I don't know if Kotlin Native is going to be there or not. I think it looks promising, but it's very hard to make a safe bet and put your entire company stakes uh, betting on one single technology. I also have seen through my career that this is one of the things that happens with uh, multi-platform technologies. You don't load the Hello World, uh, you see all the tutorials, all of them look great, very easy, you're very happy, and uh, they make sense. As soon as you start going into a real project, um, it's not that easy and not that extensible. You might not have the, uh, the ability to uh, develop a complex solution, there might be no uh, architecture patterns, no community support, etc. Uh, that's why I think Kotlin Native here has um, something important, and is that you don't need to uh, put the entire project there. You just can do um, some small parts on it. For instance, one of the things that I've been doing for many clients as a freelancer and makes a lot of sense is uh, migrating the models. When you're developing with an application, you will have your backend, the backend has responses, and a request that is accepting. Those will be essentially the same in iOS, Android. So you could say, I'm going to write all these DTOs and uh, request responses in Kotlin. It's just a data class. And you could be uploading this to a Maven repository for your Android app and for your backend, and to a pod repository for iOS. Every time you, you compile them once, essentially, you always only have to uh, maintain a code base. And this will be uh, automatically deployed to, other, uh, to all the different platforms. So you don't have um, yeah, to be like doing it individually for iOS and uh, Android, which I think is a source of uh, conflict and problems. Uh, now, more uh, things. Flutter, I think, is another of the promises in the multi-platform world. Well, Flutter has uh, one good thing, that are the custom UI widgets. Um, I think they, they perform very well. They're easy to deploy. Uh, Kotlin, I think, is, is more performant, except the compilation time. And the, uh, it has a better ecosystem. So if you uh, go to Flutter, you're using this language called Dart. Um, I don't think it's as evolved as Kotlin is. There is not as, many, as much community support as you will find with Kotlin. And, um, uh, yeah, it's uh, probably you can do a combination of both. If you Google something like Flutter and Kotlin, there is actually a session from a, um, an article written by a guy that is working at OLX in Germany. And uh, this guy did uh, an experiment where he was combining Flutter and Kotlin, exactly for this thing. He was using uh, Flutter for the UI and uh, Kotlin for everything underneath. He didn't post it any code, which uh, was a little bit unfortunate, but uh, he claimed that uh, this, this works, and he was very happy with it. So it might be something worth exploring. So some recommendations from my side. Um, I think it's something that you could use with Caution, and um, uh, not going 100% into, uh, into it. You should uh, have some, uh, probably applying it on shared components. I think that's uh, a good idea. Maybe having some small thing that can be used in, uh, in both applications and uh, doesn't need to uh, involve the 100% of the project. Keep versioning in mind. It doesn't need to go, uh, 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 so if it's not something that is actually uh, final release and stable, I would have my doubts to convince a company to adopt it. Um, but yeah, it's, uh, it's probably something that would happen at some point. Some further resources. Um, I think uh, if you are not in the Kotlin Slack, I think it's, uh, it's a, great point, a great point to start. They have a Kotlin native channel. Tatslav uh, is a company that is investing a lot. They have uh, in their Git repository a lot of um, libraries, and uh, they're exploring uh, where are the limits, at what, what can you do. They were actually the people merging the support for, for genetics, so it would be good to follow them. Of course, the Kotlin Weekly. Um, uh, we get more and more resources about uh, uh, Kotlin Native, and uh, I, I believe it's going to get just bigger from here. And the Kotlin Native documentation. You can have an extensive and intense um, 
um, um, state of the art and documentation and descriptions of all the methods here. So I think it would be a, a, a very good point to uh, follow up with it. Well, that's been it. And uh, if you have any question, I would be happy to answer it. Any question? <coughs> well, otherwise, feel free to grab me anytime. And uh, of course, if you want these uh, stickers, I'll still have a, a few more today. Thank you very much. <laughs>